Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Next Deal podcast. As always, I've got Justin Dossie, the beautiful tatted man that is on this podcast with us. Justin, what's up, man? What up? How's it going? Good, good. And we have an awesome guest this morning. We have Alex Capazzolo, uh, based out of San Diego, and he actually does business uh, with his best friend who lives on the other side of the country in Philadelphia. Um, and so, Alex, welcome to the show, man. What's up, fellas? Happy to be here. Awesome. Uh, first and foremost, um, let's just kind of talk about like, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get into, into the origin story of, you know, how you got into business. But what's it like doing business with your best friend? We're pretty lucky. Um, it's it's easy for us. Yeah. Um, not to say that there's not things that come up, little tiffs, little disagreements here and there. Um, it's taken us a while to get to where we are, but we're pretty good at this point of just like being blatantly <clears throat> blunt and ruthlessly honest and transparent with each other. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably provided a lot of that ease when we make business decisions. If one person wants to do this big marketing campaign that costs 10 grand a month, like, are we going to do that? Are we not? Um, mm -hmm. But we, we each give each other the opportunity to say how we feel both business wise and also just like emotionally about it, which I think yeah. helped because um, especially when you're, when you're in business for a long time, it's like a big part of your life. Um, so yeah. I think that's been helpful for us is just like riff openly and honestly at all times. Yeah. Did you guys go into the business together or did you start first or did John start first? We started at the same time separately, um, okay. but both had similar visions of like, we want to be in real estate. Don't know what that means. Passive income sounds cool. How do we do that? <laughs> <clears throat> and um, we kind of met in the middle after yeah. maybe doing our own thing for about a year each um, and bought in our first investment property in Philly. Um, I found the deal. He had partners that he brought in. So we own it with like two other people. Um, okay. Big party of, uh, of owners there. Big, big gathering. But um, yeah, from there, once we did our first one together, we're like, let's see if we can keep doing this. And then it just naturally progressed as we were like, you know, we wanted to get more rentals. So how do you get more rentals? You have to eventually a lot of people start doing their own marketing. And that's how we fell into flipping and then wholesaling. And then we do some retail plays as well. So we try to just monetize um, however we can. But um, yeah, that's kind of how we got our start. OK, cool. What did you guys do before real estate? John was working in a, I think it was called Save a Lot, Northeast oh, Coast. Grocery store. A grocery, grocery store. store. Yeah. Yep. He did a little, little managing of the aisles. A little aisle All right. Manager. Uh, and then I was just in sales, different, different random stuff. I worked for like uh, this company that sold software to car dealerships. So I had to train dudes, train like car salesmen people on their systems and then we sold it to them as well gotcha gotcha so you're the young guy on the 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 old sales car sales guys telling them they don't like to learn things yeah right at yeah. all yeah. <laughs> stuck, stuck in their ways a little bit yeah yeah that's yeah. great that you got sales experience early on though because like i feel if if i were to go back in time or if i'm telling people like you know hey what's one thing you could do to kind of, you know, get started at anything, I would say learn sales. Um, I think, I just think that's such a, a valuable thing to know, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's translatable to like most things in business. And then also mm -hmm. a lot of life things too. Like if you're, you know, trying to just do things throughout your day, it's helpful to just, you know, be able to hear people out, meet them where they are. Um, mirroring is a big thing too, right? Especially if you're asking mm -hmm. for something. So um, it's helpful on, in all the ways, I think. Yeah, yeah. Justin? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's something that is extremely important just as a business owner in general, right? Like that's no matter what, that's that's like your foundational skill that I think you need to know and need to understand with this. So that's, that's a cool place to start. That's where I started. It was on the phones, but, you know, selling car warranties instead of cars, uh, which yeah. is like an absolutely horrible job. But... <laughs> It is what it is. Um, what uh, what kind of got you guys interested in real estate in the first place? 
We both read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, yep. Sounds the old right. Rich Dad Love. Poor Dad. Yep. <laughs> the Gateway, the Life Changer, the Path yep. Deviator. Yeah. Right. Um, both read that book at 22, and then again we kind of fell in love with the passive income idea. We we learned since if you have a mortgage, um, it's not as passive, and you know the 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 cash flow isn't as grandiose as you you hear on podcasts um, in certain instances. But yeah, we both read that book, and then that kind of changed our mindset, and we knew that we just didn't want to stick on the path of working the W two job forever, and wanted to kind of carve our own path. Mm -hmm. Nice. How often do you uh, and John see each other in person? Probably like two or three times a year. Okay, cool. Hmm. Yeah. And how, how long have you guys been doing this now? Uh, bought our first place in 2018 together. Um, but I'd okay. say like full time running our marketing machine and like working deals and doing business probably started 2019. So about five years. Got it. Okay. And I mean, it looks like from to the form that you had sent over originally, you guys have done about 95 deals so far. Yep. Got it. And are those, are they primary wholesaling? Are you fixing and flipping, buy and hold? What does that usually look like for you guys? Yeah, we've probably done most strategies that you could do. Um, haven't done any subject to, but we've done innovation. Um, so, but yeah, most, mostly wholesale, some wholesale, okay. depending on the numbers, like if it's a better fit to close on it ourselves and just like remove some trash and put it on the market. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll try and take it down ourselves, um, have a couple of rentals and then we've done some, uh, some bigger flips as well. That's awesome. What, um, what, what's kind of been for you guys with 95 deals, you guys are doing 15, 15 a year, something like that. Um, sounds like maybe a little bit more, um, with that, what, what's been kind of your, I guess closer to 20, sorry, I can't do math apparently off the top of my head very quickly, but, um, what's kind of been your, your guys's main source of deals that you've done so far? Cause I know we hear from people all the time where there's multiple different ways they're getting deals, but kind of just curious what's, what's been working for you guys. Cause you're in some more competitive markets, right? Philadelphia, San Diego. So curious how that's been working for you guys and what you've been doing. Yeah, we've tried a lot of stuff. Um, outbound was not our jam. Definitely okay. got grinded down a little bit by, especially on yep. Philly on the East coast, calling people who don't want to be called. So yep. <laughs> you get, uh, <laughs> you get Were a lot you guys of doing that yourselves for a little while or do you hire that out? Yeah, we, everything that we've tried in terms of marketing channels, we've started ourselves and then tried to, you know, outsource the parts yeah. we didn't like. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'd say mo yeah, call, mostly call today, any capacity our lead in the past like two or three years, yeah, it's, it's been cold. probably 95% SEO in terms of okay. lead gen and then 5% referral. Okay. So with, with SEO, that's a challenging one for people to get started with because it takes time, right? What what have you guys seen that have, has worked well for you doing SEO? Um, what's kind of been your process with that? Yeah, it's changed a lot um, over the years. I'm definitely an SEO nerd for sure. Um, okay. There was a small stint of time where John and I were like breaking up, my partner John, um, for our business in 2021 because he wanted to switch things up. We didn't like what we were doing. We were getting grinded down by all these, all this outbound lead, you know, high, high quantity low quality type stuff. Um, so at that point I had learned SEO pretty well, pivoted, started offering SEO to other wholesalers. So I got up to like nine clients and I was helping a couple different people in different markets do their SEO. Uh, but even since then, that was 2021, the SEO has changed. Google changes all the freaking time. They mm -hmm. release algorithm updates. They, cause everyone's trying to game the system, right? That's what SEO is more right, or less. Right. Uh, so if you're at the top, you're, usually intentionally there, you know? Um, so yeah, our process has changed a lot. We've had people work for us internally and help us out. Uh, now we have robots, AKA chat GBT help us out a lot. Um, so that's been like a big shift in the whole SEO industry in general is if you can leverage different, you know, chat GBT for content, that's like, that's huge. So that's something that we've been utilizing and that's, um, helped out a lot in terms of growth recently. 
don't get Justin started on chat GPT. You two, you're a fan or you're not a fan? You you two could just like talk and I'll just be sitting over here, you know, eating popcorn. (laughs) I I, I do like it. I use it all the time. Um, (laughs) I'm curious when you're using that for content, are you guys changing it at all when you're doing it too, or are you just using what it's giving you? Like what's, what's been working for you? Yeah, we, we still change it. I still edit it um, and add some stuff. Uh, Google's, Google's know, knows what's going on, right? They know that mm-hmm. everyone and their mother's using ChatGPT yeah. to write blogs yeah. and they don't, they don't want it to be super saturated with, with crap all over the internet, which it kind of already is even before ChatGPT. There's just so, there's like internet bloat right now. So Google, it's this huge issue where Google can't even crawl all the pages and websites because there's just so much to crawl. Um, so what we do is just, yeah, I go through, I edit stuff and you have to add like personal things in there and just, you know, say things that you think a robot wouldn't say, like even adding like a specific example, if we're talking about how to buy a fixer upper, that's the blog post. Maybe I'd write like, and for example, my partner and I did X, Y, Z with one, two, three numbers and this, that, and the third, like make really specific things that sound real and hopefully they are or not, whatever. Yeah. Um, but that helps Google be like, okay, that's maybe not a robot. Yeah. Right. This isn't uh this isn't all just completely written by by a non person. So yeah, because I've seen it a couple of times where people will just straight copy and paste and it's like, eh, you're doing more harm than good, unfortunately. Long term by doing that. And I've 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 unfortunately seen that. Or you'll sometimes get emails from people where you're like, no way somebody wrote this. Like I can tell already <laughs> that no <laughs> nobody talks this way. Like you get an email and it's like Hello, gentleman Vince. I hope your day is well. And I'm like, that's weird, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, like yeah. It starts, <laughs> start start something like that. Yeah, yeah. If you if your email sounds like it's from Shakespeare, it's probably from ChatGPT. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Could not could not agree more. What um we talked about a little little bit little bit about this at the beginning or before we started, but how how has it worked for you guys? doing deals in bigger markets because i think a lot of people i don't know if they run away but like get anxious or they're you know i don't think people realize the extra effort or marketing or things like that that it might take to get deals done in places like that even though like spreads are bigger you're probably going to make way more money as opposed to like a midwest market in st louis or kansas city or you know ohio places like that so could you talk a little bit about to what that looks like for you guys in San Diego and Philadelphia and how that's kind of worked for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, Philly, at least, I mean, both cities are pretty big, right? Philly and San yeah. Diego, yeah. both markets are big. Um, it's, it, it, I'd go back to the saying, like, if you're thinking about getting into a bigger market, if there, although there's more competition for sure, there's also a bigger pie. So there'll be more slices for each person trying to get their piece, you know? Um, so I wouldn't be dissuaded by, um a bigger market even if it's one of the most competitive ones around um philly was a little easier but i'd say like we really started hitting our stride by almost just like surviving longer as a business Uh, we got more in tune with our buyers list we have a bunch more pocket buyers now that we've you know a couple go-to people that we then just on the wholesale side those yeah we know that they would love this property and it really helps you monetize a lot of leads that you think you can't because it's like, oh, no one on this our buyers list is going to even blink at this. But we know one pocket buyer that would actually maybe dig this and that could, you know, pop up another 5, 10, 15K spread that you weren't expecting. So I'd say just like longevity yeah. is, is a big thing in terms of growing your business long term in a competitive market. Um, networking, obviously, but that's, everyone says getting into anything network, but it's obviously important with your buyers yep. list and and other things. Um, for San Diego, it's for sure more competitive than Philadelphia in our experience. Um, and there, there's a couple big companies, one in particular, that just, they're like a 3,000 pound gorilla. Um, got, they, they got stacks of, of marketing yeah. dollars and cash and we see it everywhere. Just blanket um, everything. Totally, yeah. yeah. T, like TV, radio, direct mail. I got this. It's funny. So I, I rent my apartment here in San Diego with my wife. Um, so we don't own it. So our, <laughs> our landlords, cause they sometimes, we sometimes get the mail of our landlords occasionally. Um, and if we do, they just say, open it, send us a picture, whatever. So that's what we do. Um, got a, literally got a direct mail piece from 
one of our competitors for our landlords. And I was like, oh, oh really? I know these guys. <laughs> and um, I was I was actually like amazed. I sent it to my partner, John, immediately. And I was like, dude, like, this is why they're doing so good. This piece of mail is actually sick. <laughs> mm. It was um, they it was like a fake check that okay. they sent. Yeah, a fake check. And it but it looks like a stimmy check. Like it's like a full eight by 11 piece of paper. But the top third is a check and it has my landlord's name on it the price the ad like it looks super hmm. like you know it's not super real but it also looks real um, yeah I think, I think we should talk about our check mailers at ballpoint so Park. we we did just release one of those for ballpoint <laughs> the, the only difference is it's written with a pen actually yeah, instead of printed written, yeah. uh so it looks like someone sat there and wrote a check uh out to it but yeah i mean i, I those types of those types of products work great and especially in that market if you've got the money to drop and blanket like that's that's such a big thing there um because I, I know a couple people that have that are in san diego that um I don't, I don't know if you know greg helbeck um but he's he's a guy that is in san diego and he's one of those guys that's like he's strictly direct mail uh is what he does he doesn't get a deal every month but when he does he makes some giant spreads on them like hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time. And it's, you know, that's, that's just his play. That's what he does is he, he goes out and he, he blankets it with marketing and he's targeting a very specific niche and he knows what he's doing. And so when those deals do come, come in, they're very fruitful. Um, and he might be doing them more than one a month. I could be totally wrong. It's been a minute since I talked to him, but, um, you know, when you're used to a 10 to $15,000 wholesale fee in the Midwest, and then you hear, people in San Diego or LA or Seattle making a couple hundred grand on one. It's like, yeah, but you also don't realize how long it took to get that deal or how much money it took to get that deal too. So you're going to spend four to five times the amount on marketing to get that same deal. Totally. Yeah. More than meets the eye. Exactly. Justin. Um, yeah. And it's good to know that you guys do that check mailer thing. Yeah. That, like I said, when I got that, I was like, if I was a 70 year old grandma lady, I would probably call this company back. Um, so, <laughs> grandma um, lady, yeah, or who you know, who even for yeah. you know, even for me, I was like, this is legit. Um, so I will probably be me and John. Me and John are thinking about doing something like that because you know, okay. when you do some a, a mailer like that, it's like more. I feel like more people would maybe hang on to it and keep it. So although it's probably more expensive than a postcard or whatever, um, I feel like it would be kept and maybe more effective. Um, and you could even send one out, and then just that could be your mailer for like the next couple months, assuming that, you know, that's pretty much as that's going to hit well for a lot of people. I feel like it would at yeah. least. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the thing we've seen with them so far, um, cause we released them in February, but I also know a lot of people that have done the printed ones through other companies too. And the, the theme that I've seen with them is you just have to be very careful with your offer percentage, right? Cause that's, that's the whole thing is like, you get the value of the property and you pick a percentage of what you're going to offer. The lower you go, the more pissed people are going to be. You're going to get, you're going to have more pissed off people. You're going to get more phone calls, but most of them are going to be angry. If you go too high, you might have less phone calls, but they're going to be quality. So like we found kind of a sweet spot between like 80 and 85% of market value somewhere around there. Cause ultimately, as we all know, like that's sight unseen offers, right? Things are going to change. Once you get in, you see what's going on what kind of work needs to be done. And that's, that's usually where you can communicate and talk with the seller from there. Let them know like, Hey, you know, that's a sight unseen offer. If the house was in perfect condition, that's where we would be at. But here's what we can do now based off of what we've seen and kind of what we have to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a couple of our clients do really, really well with them so far since releasing them, but that's been the, the caveat I always like to say is like, just make sure you're, you're not going too low on your offer percentage because then you're, you'll get more calls, but they're not going to be good calls. <laughs> Pissed off at you. Yeah. Yep. yep. It's all, it's all a balance. Yeah. We had somebody, I think tried it like 55% and they're like, I got so many calls, but Oh my God, they were not fun calls. Like, yeah, yeah. I, when you hit someone with an insultingly low offer off the bat, like even though you might end up there based off of repairs and all that kind of stuff, but starting off there without any context is yeah not 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 a great percentage to start at in my my opinion yeah and that's like the interesting thing too when you really think about like this the psychology of make like when you make the offer and who you're making it to it's like if you think this person has already gotten an offer from someone say you're 
if they're just on a lot of lists and you're mailing that list, it's like they probably are already anchored somewhere, right? But if your mm -hmm. if your list is really niche, um, and you know this could be they haven't been called or door knocked or whatever, um, setting that temperature really low can be sometimes good <clears throat> yeah. or sometimes bad because then they're like, oh, I, that's I've never gotten an offer for my property in the last couple of years, and this is insanely low low ball. You know, it can yep. go a lot of different directions, but it's interesting to kind of kind of think of like where you want to anchor yourself and why. Yeah. I always like yeah. it when someone goes, well, I went to Zillow and my house is worth. Well, it's fun funny. We have uh, our COO Jeremy's in town. Uh, we're going to the Cardinals home opener tomorrow with, with the team here uh, that Vince is going to, but um, we we're sitting on my couch last night and he got uh, a lead from somebody in a mastermind that we're in and uh it was like i think the arv was like 550 is what they were saying and they got it under contract for like 300 and so jeremy was like yeah send me all the details that sounds like a good deal except if you once you look up the address it's like well you're using comps from two miles away like the comps within that neighborhood within that street are more like 400 425 and it's it's funny you see it on both sides from from homeowners, but also sometimes from from different wholesalers and people that come up with deals too. It's like, well, being a little liberal with with where you're choosing to uh, to get those numbers from. Yeah, it, keep it at, at a quarter mile. I, that's yeah. what I do most. And yeah, then, quarter mile, yeah, same neighborhood. Yeah, a ranch has got to be compared with a ranch, a two story with a two story. Like, yeah, yep. Yeah, it was just pretty yeah, funny. We didn't even like, put. I'm sorry, Justin. No, you're good. I was, was going to say, say it was just funny that it just came up like literally last night too. Yeah. Yeah. That is interesting. We don't, when we wholesale deals, we don't even put ARVs um, because we, just since we know Philly at least, and that's the majority of our business right now is there. We, we usually feel pretty good pricing it. Um, and then we also know, right. Everyone kind of has their own way of doing it anyway. So it's like hard to say how much that helps. Unless, unless we really feel like the deal sucks <laughs> and maybe we right. try and keep yeah. it up relevantly of course um with other properties and the comps but um yeah it's not something that we do super often hmm. makes a lot of sense what um what makes you guys because you mentioned earlier you hotel, hotel deals sometimes too and i know everyone's kind of got some different criteria but when when do you guys decide to hotel something versus wholesale or flip it <sighs> i'd say it depends on just like the exit um the thing we look at first, I'd say, is if it needs, if we think it'll be better off listed on the market and selling it that way. Um, and if we're not in a rush, like if we have the funds at that time and we can just take it down and put it back on the market, whether that means we're cleaning it out beforehand or, yeah, we've done, I'd say we've done a couple. That's probably the most common one. We'll buy it, clean it out, and then we think it's, you know, it's not in bad shape. So we could see it doing well, even if someone, if the buyer's paying with a loan or, or something like that. Um, we like to give it that it's its best opportunity, which sometimes is on the market. Not always, if it's a place that's like a fixer up or a dump and needs a lot of love, um, we're just like our buyers, this is probably the best place for this anyway. So um, we think about the exit first and then decide what makes sense. Yeah, good. Got it. Almost take Here. it on like a case by case basis. Yep, yeah. exactly. Got it. When you uh, when you say clean it out, are there you know any any minor things like switching the carpet out, painting the walls, or are you just simply just like literally just cleaning it out and touching things up a little bit? Yeah, it depends. There's been times we've taken yeah. up the carpet. If there's like you know decent hardwood under, underneath or or whatever, but um, depends. Yeah, it depends on each one. I'd say. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean we're we're kind of similar too. We'll we'll take it because we. I know some people have like specific criteria they're looking for. It has to meet this, has to meet this, has to meet this kind of thing. Um, but we do something pretty similar where we take it case by case on that property. And if we think, yeah, this will perform pretty well, we'll move it over and put it out on on the MLS on there too. So I, I can definitely see that. Um, forgot what I was going to ask. I had a question and I don't remember what it is. Vince, do you have a question while I think of what mine was? You muted. Yeah, I think you muted yourself, bro. <laughs> Sorry. There we I go. Was, <laughs> I muted myself. It's Luna again. 
being upstairs, being a crazy animal. Um, muted that because she was barking at somebody. But anyways, um, I didn't hear what you just said before that. But I do have a question, uh, not re real estate related. Um, surfing, it's 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 on your form, so I kind of want to talk about that. Uh, I've never surfed before in my life. Uh, I know people who have. Um, I bet it's pretty damn awesome in San Diego. Are you terrified of great whites at all? <laughs> Admittedly, yes. Yes, right. <laughs> I haven't seen one while I was in the water. Um, one time I saw, it was the scariest thing. It, we were like, it was me and my wife taking a walk on a cliff right next to my, my main surf spot um, in Del Mar that I would usually go to. And there's this woman playing with a golden retriever, probably like six feet into the ocean. Um, so she probably couldn't stand. I think they were both kind of doggy paddling together, swimming, playing yeah. the tennis ball. And then we we literally see this massive shadow next to her. And I'm like, and we're so far away. Like we can't even whistle to her or yeah. anything. And we're looking like my wife and I are like, is that, you know, it's a sunny day. It's like the afternoon. We can see pretty clearly. And since we were, we were so high up on the cliff, we could see down at that shadow. And we're like, is that a, is that a thing? Like, that's not a big clump of sea. Like, we're like, that is a freaking shark. We're like, Jeez. oh, like, and we start, but we're so far away. I was trying to whistle, like a loud whistle like that or yell. We were too far away. Couldn't hear us. Um, and then we keep watching. Like, are we about to see a shark attack? Holy, like this thing is huge. It's probably, probably like nine feet. Way oh. bigger than her. Um, mm -mm. Just right there. And um, I think she notices it and her dog notices it. And they both kind of like paddle a little more intensely thankfully get out of the water quick and the thing just drifts and you don't wow. even see a fin or anything but it just the shadow just slowly goes away but i totally for sure know it, it, was, it was the outline of a shark it was it was a shark um and if you look on google there's there's been like teenagers who have flown drones yeah. um in around that beach and every usually when the water's a little warmer like in the summertime um the shark the the juvenile great whites the juvenile white sharks roll through because they're eating like stingrays and stuff and then mm -hmm. There's like one person that gets bit a year, usually around here. Yeah, I'm a, my kids and I are huge uh, Shark Week on Discovery Channel in like uh, July, August. And they're always talking about San Diego um, area and, and, and surfing. Dude, that story, I thought when you were starting off, when you mentioned shark and golden retriever, I was like, oh, great. Here we go. <laughs> Dog attack. I know. Shark's a goner. Yeah. 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 yeah, luckily a happy ending. But it's I've also heard like... You guys ever hear the saying like no matter where you are in the world there's always a spider within like yes. six feet of you or like something yes. like that yeah i i think it's like similar ish with sharks um i i kind of believe that like there's always like something probably nearby that you don't really know about they're not typically going after humans um unless it's like a mega 20 foot great white shark which we don't really have a lot of those here they don't really come too close to the ocean so um yeah. if people do get bit which is very very uncommon i wouldn't and i wouldn't be worried about it um whether you were swimming or surfing um it's really just like they think you're a seal they bite you a little bit and then you're mm -hmm. like they let go because they realize you're a human and they're like right yeah just like a seal yeah. little little nip yeah i think we yeah. lost well, Justin, by the way oh yeah <laughs> he, he got taken out by that shark oh man he did he he heard sharks and he's like man i'm out of here uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're we're, we're kind of coming towards the uh, to, toward the end anyways. But um, man, like when you guys got into real estate, um, you know, obviously you, you guys are weighing the risks. It's super exciting. Things of that sort. You know, we're here on the Next Deal podcast. We always kind of like to end with, you know, someone's getting into the business. Like what's a what's a tidbit of information you would say to a newcomer like Hey, here's here's my bit of advice um, going into this. Yeah, I would say if you're just getting into it, find define cl as clear as you can what your goals are, what you want to do, what you want to achieve, and that could be like get ten rental properties that generate two hundred bucks a month in cash flow. That could mean flip five properties a year, wholesale mm -hmm. ten, you know, whatever. Define that super clearly, and then niche down within that sub right. niche of real estate um and really master it so like for example like people can 
some real estate investors are really, they have probate nailed down. That's all they do. They spend mm -hmm. their day networking with probate attorneys and other people within the space. They know the, the course schedules. They know exact dates, timelines, and deadlines of how all that stuff works. Um, a lot of people don't because that stuff's pretty complicated. It's not fun to learn, but I would just say like pick your niche yeah. and really master it. And once you reach a mastery level of anything, it's like opportunities kind of come or you can make things out of opportunities that maybe wouldn't have been otherwise. So just get, go, you know, yeah, you can identify and and whatever when other people do. want it as well, for sure. Yeah. I, I really like that, that, um, being, being very specific, uh, niching things down. I can't tell you how many times on this, you know, on this podcast, I think we're, you know, we've only done 20 or something, but it seems like every single person talks about like any horror story that they've ever had in their business because they went outside of what they normally do um, to try to do it without really knowing how, and it turned into a disaster. <laughs> so, um, you know, just kind of learning from people that have been in it a long time. Um, what would you also say to someone who's newer, doesn't have a ton of funds to do any outreach? Um, like how would there you- There we go, I'm back. <laughs> He's back. Um, <laughs> so sorry oh that's all right that's all right we we just kept going man yeah you thought you got good, scared off good. By i was charge. hoping so i was like uh what the heck's going on here so yeah I'm yeah back. We were, anyway we were talking about sharks and justin got scared um we'll just we'll just leave it at that dude i hate sharks i forgot about that i yeah that's that's like my worst fear you. is like swimming and seeing a giant shark i'm good i will probably never get back in the ocean again if that happens <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it, the ocean's you. a scary place, man. We know more about the surface well, of the moon and Mars than we do about our own oceans. So I'll tell you a funny story that my wife hates me for. Actually, the one I did see a shark one time, and it didn't go well. Uh, <laughs> we were in Jamaica with a, another couple, and it was like you pushed know, three out years ago, said, and her. we saw a giant sand shark, like which is not going to hurt you, right? Like they. They don't really bite like they're like I've heard people call them like puppies in the water, but still a shark. And I don't like sharks in general. And we're all just walking and it's like, I don't know, we're probably 20 feet offshore, but it's only like three feet deep. Like the water's pretty shallow. And I was just chilling there. Dude, I saw it and I bolted to the shore and forgot I even had a wife like. <laughs> <laughs> but Kara was like, uh, what the hell, bro? And I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't even like. My mind didn't even think that. I was like, fuck this. I'm getting out of the water. Um, so, yeah, she she hates that story. But, uh, yeah, that, that was like my only experience ever seeing a shark in the water. And it wouldn't have even hurt hurt either one of us. But I'm not a fan. But you, but you <laughs> left your wife for dead, man. I do. I did. I felt so bad. I was like, uh, I don't even know why. I mean, you were with two other people, so you're probably OK. But, yeah, it was it was one of those moments where I was like, I failed as a husband in that moment, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, you could say like you were trying to deep, like, you know, make the shark go a different path. Like follow me them, running that yeah. way, still yeah. splashing over there, trying yeah. to save your life. You know, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's yeah. It was so funny though. I was like, I didn't even realize what just happened. Like just was like, Nope, I'm out of the water immediately. <laughs> what, what's the saying? Put on your oxygen mask yourself before you, before you yeah, put it on. Exactly. Others? Exactly. Yeah. And then it just swam away slowly. Like she was fine, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's a sore subject <laughs> admittedly, which makes sense. That's funny. Uh, but, sorry. No, that's right. Yeah. No, but like I said, we were just, we were just kind of still chatting and going through things kind of, uh, you know, talking more about, you know, on this podcast, if anybody was a little bit newer, you know, Alex giving a little bit of advice and then we were kind of getting into the, um, you know, like, Hey, I don't have enough funds or, you know, I don't have enough money. Like what direction would you give someone who's just starting out thinking they need a lot of money? Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, when you here, here's the thing, the gurus say you don't need any money. That's a just complete lie. If you hear anybody on the internet and Instagram and saying, you don't need any money, just tell them to piss off. You do. I'm just, you do. There's startup costs. There's, if you want to be legit, there's branding and, you know, all kinds of different things you do. have. <laughs> They, they forget the important part that like you might not necessarily need money need money to do the deal if you're wholesaling. Right. Yes, exactly. But there is still money needed for the business to exactly. run it and do stuff and to find yeah. the deal. So yeah. yes, I totally agree. Yeah. 
Um, so if someone was short of funds, how would you tell them to get their first deal? Like, what would you, what would you direct them to do? A lot of times when people, there's other people out there that have the funds and not the time. So if you have the time and not the funds, meet that person in the middle, Bingo. right? So yep. just keep networking with people. Again, if you define your goals and what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go, um, you can also probably maybe identify people in your community or your city or different real estate groups nearby that are doing that specific goal. So I'd find those people and then see what they need. And if you have time um, and you can add value to them, I mean, it's, it's like an age old saying, just go and add value where you can. Um, but that really, that's worth money. That's worth, that has some value to it. So, you know, you can do that, put in the time, put in the sweat equity, put in your hard work. And if, if that means you're splitting the first couple deals with someone or however you decide to design it with that person or whatever, um, it's, you know, you'd rather have a portion of one deal than, uh, you know, zero. zero. Yep. Yeah. And it's, you, you said a good thing in there too, that I, I absolutely love. And it's, even if you're giving up equity in your first couple deals, you're going to learn more than you're losing. Like you, you always will. And for me, like the way I've seen it, even in our own deals, like, <clears throat> uh, when we started a new market two years ago, you know, there'd be times, uh, with, we had a deal and we didn't have, we wanted to wholetail it or do a small flip or something like that. And we tapped out our private money. And like, we went back to one of our private money lenders and we're like, Hey, I know we've got, you know, X amount out with you, but on this deal, we really think it's a good deal. What if we split it 50, 50, would you be interested in funding it? They're like, yeah, no problem. Absolutely. I was like, as long as you know, like, we're not always going to do this, but like when it comes up, we'll do this. And they're like, yeah, that's totally fine. So we're able to get a completely other deal done that we wouldn't have had we not asked for that kind of stuff. So yeah, don't, don't be afraid to, to do that stuff. It's, it's a great way to get started and learn. And you're, you're only going to learn from these people too, when you're working with them. Yeah. And you, you never know. That's like a great example, Justin. You, you never know who's going to say yes to something like that until you ask. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask. Like, cause that was it's funny. It's uh, when because it was kind of a newer relationship with this guy, and we had probably half a million out with him already. And he's in a, a mastermind that I'm in, and I was talking to the owner of the mastermind, and I was like, I was like, man, I really need like another two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for this deal that I know is a really good deal, but I've already got half a million out with him. I'm kind of you know, I don't think I should ask him. And he's like, fuck that, just ask him. He's like, he's. He, he's like, he's got the money. He's like, just ask him. And I was like, okay. And immediately he was like, yeah, sure. No problem. I was like, well, Hey, I'm glad I asked because <laughs> otherwise that deal would have been wholesaled for 10 grand instead of, you know, us, uh, it's listed right now, but we should each make 25 on it once it sells, you know? So, but yeah, I, if I wouldn't have asked then I would have been afraid to ask, like I was originally, that wouldn't happen. I would have to wholesale it. And the more conversations you have like that, the easier they get and the more comfortable you feel asking. Yes. You know? Very true. Now with that guy, I'll be like, Hey, I got a deal. What do you think? And he's like, yep. let, let me talk it over. I'm like, all right, cool. And yeah, I, think- I don't, I don't think he said no yet. So, you know, that's like you said, you don't know until you ask. I need to get access to this guy. Um, uh, he's mine. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> It's uh, uh, in, in, I got in, very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really don't be afraid to just sit, tell people what you're doing. You know, like there's, there's, I don't know, I guess there's some, sometimes there's a stigma against like, you know, people are like, I'm in real estate investing. It's like, Oh yeah. One of those, you know, um, just, just continue to tell people like what you're doing, um, be open about what you're doing, why you're doing it, like all that kind of stuff. And e- even with Susie, um, you know, her, her clients as, you know, a salon owner, they've actually come up and said like, Hey, you know, if, if Vince, you know, needs some funding on some stuff, we'd be happy to, to, to look into that, you know, nice. They, they would have never known about that if Susie didn't talk mm-hmm. about it, you know, and, uh, essentially when you're a hairstylist, you're also like, a shrink you know people you just talk right and you're just talking a bunch of stuff and so literally a therapist yeah you're and so um there's been opportunities that have been opened up for you know private money lenders um which is great yeah yeah and it's um the more i mean you're right the more i've talked about it the more more lenders we have found and 
that, but we've also had deals brought to us too, that we wouldn't mm-hmm. have had brought to us if we weren't talking about it, you know, and just yep. letting people know where we're at. But yeah, no, I, yeah. Did I keep forgetting my questions. I had another question and I freaking lost it again. Uh, I don't know why, don't know why I keep losing these questions today. And just kind of going off your thread just now, Justin, it's like, there's always something, look, someone looking for something specific. So it's like, just talking about what you're doing. Maybe you have a weird deal that you're having trouble move or like whatever. It's like, then maybe you'll meet someone who like loves quadplexes that are fire damaged. And it's like a really weird one, but you found that guy or <laughs> the one that you're like, I would never deal with this property, but yeah, someone yeah, else totally. might. <laughs> yeah. 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 Some people love that. Yeah. So um, it just, you know, it, it's just a testament to like tell people what you're doing, network, add value, have conversations and then, just have that abundant abundance mindset with every interaction is is helpful. Yeah. 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 No, dude. Oh, dude. That's I'm so glad you said that. I do remember what I was going to say earlier, though. But on, on the abundance stuff, that's such a I don't think you would do deals in San Diego and Philadelphia if you didn't have that mindset. Am I wrong? No, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Like if the, it's such a common thing that that I see with newbies, especially, especially on like the marketing side of things. Cause we talk to people about marketing all the time. And when someone is starting out, you get in that scarcity mindset very easily of like, I just, I need a deal. I need a deal to happen. And if anybody else is marketing in my area, I'm not going to get a deal, which is so far from the truth. Like even in St. Louis, uh, Vinny just started and I'm not going to give away too much because we're going to talk about it on our podcast tomorrow that we're recording, but like just started in January and has got deals done already. And like just brand new to this space as a, as a real estate investor, you know, on, on the side here. But like I go to a, a week or a monthly real estate investor meetup here in St. Louis that's hosted by two of the top guys in St. Louis. They do two to 300 deals a year here in St. Louis. There's 150 other people in there and St. Louis maybe has like half a million households in the metro area. Everyone is getting deals done. Like that's actually trying and putting in effort. And we have so many times in in calls on ballpoint where someone's like, well, if I send 3000 pieces of mail in Dallas, aren't other people sending mail in Dallas? Like, yeah, yeah, they absolutely are. But a Dallas is huge. You might not be sending to the same area, but the way we look at it here in St. Louis, and I'm sure you look at it this way too, Alex is like, if me and a friend show up at the same deal, like guess who's getting the deal? It's going to be me. It's not you. <laughs> like I'm going to be the one to get the deal. <laughs> so there's, there's totally. always deals to be made. Yeah. And there's like, there's strategies around, like, if you know there's competition involved and you know there's a meeting, there's a meeting before you are meeting and you can't do anything about it and you can't lock yeah. it up over the phone. They need to be in person, whatever. They want to see all this through. They're shopping around, whatever. You know, there's, there's that term like scorching the earth, which people have done where it's like, yeah, you, know, you kind of like leave some casual landmines after you meet with the person in a way of just like trying to box them out slash like make your like highlight why your offer is good and almost for the for that like that specific one if you know there's competition you might notice this tactic from other people you know they might try this they might you know do this and then that's gonna happen you're like i told you (laughs) yeah yeah exactly the whole like taking off my investor hat now and just to let you know what you might also see out there in the world of real estate just to help you out kind of yeah and um Mm -hmm. and but you really you know it's like there are also fly by night sketchy people out there too. So like what there's, sure. there is truth to that, you know, um, and yeah. educating people on that is also not a bad thing. I don't think. Totally. Yeah. And I, I just know I'm going to build more rapport or our team's going to build more rapport. They're going to have a better relationship. They're going to stick around longer. They're going to talk more. And that's, that's why we beat out people when we go to deals, even if there's, you know, you get those ones where like, I'm, I'm taking offers on this day and there's like nine people there. Like, all right, cool. That's fine. We'll, we'll be the ones that are there the longest. We're going to build the best rapport and we're most likely going to pull that deal out. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing I wanted to say earlier that I totally forgot, but I found it, found this one. Um, when we were talking about just like asking for money and, and finding like that private money kind of stuff, something I had to get over and I, I don't know, Vince, I, I think you grew up kind of similar to me, like middle class kind of family. Yeah. ish. Um, yeah. Alex, like not, not sure how you grew up, but like, I knew, I know the way that like I grew up, like we didn't talk about money and like we were kind of 
shied away from talking about money and like money's evil or it's bad or you know like we just we don't bring that up because it's rude kind of thing and for me like that was a big like mindset hurdle i had to get over when actually talking about money and realizing that everybody doesn't think that way and most people that that have money that are looking to place it and put it places have no problem talking about like dollar amounts percentages what they can do what they can't do and if you can recognize that or if you realize like that that's a problem for you of like well that seems rude to just you know or weird to ask for a quarter million dollars on a deal when you know it's someone i know but like i don't know their financial situation like like alex said you don't know until you ask and have that conversation and usually the people that are much more further along financially don't typically have issues having those conversations because they got to that point for a reason <laughs> they're they're not in you know the lower middle class or middle class anymore like they, they got to that point for a reason and they're they might not tell you every single penny they have but you know they'll, they'll be much more willing to have those types of conversations mm -hmm. 100 yeah I, I love that it's like especially in the us I, you're, I think you nailed it it's like people hate talking about money the majority of people yeah. it seems like because it does feel awkward and seem awkward or just weird like a yeah. tab very taboo um but yep it doesn't have to be money is like it's just, it's an exchange of energy right it's like the oldest forms of bartering like you know we've transformed from bartering to you know eventually having some kind of currency and that's how trades were then used yep. so it's really just an exchange is the way to think about it and if you're getting involved with someone and say borrowing money it's like you want to do it when it's a win-win, right? And if you're borrowing money, you're paying probably some kind of interest, 10, 12, whatever percent, if it's hard money or private, whatever. But, um, you know, if you do a good job, you execute on your on your timeline, like they're also making money, which is a good thing. So it's like, right. you know, have that in your mind too when you're, if you're asking for half a million, a million bucks, if you execute, which you think, you know, you shouldn't be asking for it unless you think you can. Yeah, um, yeah. That person's winning big too, which is great. So it's a win-win. Yep. Yeah especially if everybody's winning that's that's a good point to it <clears throat> yeah even on this uh this last deal that matt and i made you know we needed the transactional funding and the guy was said hey you can have it and then we end up not needing it and we still gave him you know like 500 bucks for just admin stuff right which was which was good right because we're still building rapport with this lender saying like hey even though we didn't need your transactional funding we still want to be able to like pay you for your time um, oh yeah you know he was super like appreciative of oh yeah and they're they're gonna remember that stuff yeah when it comes time for the next deal like well vince treated me right even though he didn't use the money yeah you know um yeah super important i love that yeah pe people remember that yeah 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 the the number number one rule with lenders is always treat your lenders better than you would treat anybody else <laughs> make <laughs> make things work well for them pay your payments on time like take them out to dinner, whatever it is, like make, make those relationships extremely solid. And like Alex said, it comes down to, to networking, network well, have good relationships with people. And that's, that's when you find out too, because I've, I've even had people hit me up that are like friends from when I was in my early twenties that are like, Hey, I've got, you know, hundred grand sitting, you know, can you help me put it to use? Like, I, I just don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. And it's it only comes up by having good rapport and good relationships with people that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it might not be for the full, maybe I just need funding for a flip one time or something like that. Right. But, you know, it's stuff like that, that you start to find additional, additional access points or funding or people that you can work with that you might, you might have never thought that that money was there. You know, like this, this person that came to me, like, I wouldn't have known, like I've, I don't know his financial situation super well, like, but you know, I also forgot that he had bought a couple, bought his own home, sold it at the peak of the market, got a new home at a great deal and like had all this, this cash from the equity. And I'm like, no, oh, I didn't even think about it. You know, just like things like that, that can come up, but it doesn't come up if you don't have that, that networking, that rapport. Yeah. Totally. And those ones are cool too. When you do it with like a friend or, or just old friends. Yeah. And Different, yeah. different parts of your life because then it's like everyone's stoked when you win yeah yeah exactly you're like cool i just made a friend money i love that like they helped me we helped them and you know long term the goal is to keep helping them make more money especially if they don't have to do anything for it 
because it's I, I don't know about you guys for me because i'm in this space so much i just assume everybody's a real estate investor or is interested in real estate investing and it's like it's really a pretty small population <laughs> that, that is that is actually in this and, and an entrepreneur or interested in it and like i have to i forget all the time and don't even realize it when i'm talking to people that maybe have a normal w2 or you know they're in a different field or something like that and i'm like damn it's weird because i'm so used to it and it's all i talk about i just assume everybody does it uh and they don't so it's it's a it's a good reminder yeah we're all we're all like related <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> oh. we're, all, we're all a bunch of weird second cousins to each other right exactly. uh -huh. yeah it's like every I, conference has the same people at it and <laughs> it does it's like hey how's it going I've, i saw you at the last one like is there going to be anything different at this conference we'll see uh yeah. but it's yeah I, I had a guy um yesterday that i met here i re-met apparently i met him at some point um i re-met him at a at an event recently here in st louis and he <clears throat> said he was going through old business cards sent me a picture one picture of the old call porter business cards that ryan and i had from five or six years ago that were metal and it was the logo of the call porter guy i was like dude i have not seen one of those in forever he's like i didn't even know i had this he's like so we met at some point somewhere i was like that's actually really funny because neither one of us remember each other <laughs> but it was my business card and uh yeah i was like we must have met at a different event or something and you know just super funny super funny is that, that, is that back when you used to like buzz your hair yeah 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 that's actually could be could be could be it too it was i was also <laughs> fatter at that point too so that might be it <laughs> i see that buzzed hair come up every now and then like on yeah. certain things and i'm like justin it was so easy it was so easy but like yeah i don't miss it i feel like i, I look weird with it now cold colder winters with that style oh yes very cold i kind of but it was funny i never shaved my head in the summer i did it in the winter because i liked how my like having a cold head i don't know like it's just like it's kind of refreshing <laughs> but yeah uh, no i haven't done that in years that's funny Maybe I'll do it one day for you, Vinny, just randomly. <laughs> I do, I do think me. we just need to randomly have mustaches on this podcast. Alex would that. Uh, guarantee it. <laughs> I would have. Yeah, let's let's get some AI mustaches on our faces. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> AI, just real ones. Just real ones. Just get rid of the beard. Yeah. I remember when, when Dom was on, you know, that was the, I was like, dang, we should have planned ahead and all three of us had just straight mustaches. Have. That'd have been great. Next next mustache person that comes on, we can plan that. Yeah. <laughs> My wife's gonna hate oh, me, man. but we can do that. Do it for the pod. <laughs> it seems, yeah, that seems like a good place to end on mustache. Yeah, yep. Yep. <laughs> I was gonna say any any final uh Cinco to final mustache. closing thoughts, either one of you guys. I mean, just to continue the mustache thread, if you have a mustache and then you see people with mustaches, it's an easy icebreaker. So if you're like nervous about networking at real estate meetups, mustache it up, Go find for the mustache, mustache tribe and, and hit it okay. off. Okay. Okay. I like that. I always look like I'm a cop. So there'll be times where like I've, I'll like trim my beard and just leave my mustache real long. I'm like, I look like a cop. <laughs> or like, like a firefighter. Yeah, yeah, or a firefighter, uh, paramedic, something like that. Yeah, in the in the military, I would do a mustache every now and then, and people called me Goose. They're like, "Dude, you look you look straight up like Goose." That's so, funny. Yeah, that's hilarious. But a uh, parting word on real estate stuff, I would say, um, yeah, like the niche thing. Just thinking about that more, I don't think I've ever said that like out loud in that way, but I think that is really actually important. It'll be more of a pain in the butt to like educate yourself just on probate or divorce or like whatever fire damage but if you really really master it it's like you can truly excel at that point and then find the people also in that space and it's going to be a lot smaller than man yeah. if you're just starting off in tampa or miami you're like somewhere huge that's really intimidating and like you might get scared off and not do it so just find your niche master it go super deep um and put in the time now and it'll just get easier and then once you're well versed in it, it's like learning a language right it's like It'll become second nature and then you can really grow from there and kind of identify the opportunities once mm -hmm. you like know the ins and outs of all of it. So don't overcomplicate it. Stick with one strategy and like drill super deep into that one. That's awesome. Complete. 
completely agree. And I'll bring it up again for people that have listened, or if you didn't go back and listen to this one with Devin Robinson that we did, I don't know, three, four weeks ago, he did exactly that, learned everything he could about for sale by owners, went super deep into it for six months, just learning about it. And the next six months pulled out 70 deals doing it. Like great, great words of advice. Like go find your niche, go deep. And the, the less scattered you can be, the better. <laughs> Less shotgun approach, more more sniper approach. That's that's what's going to get you get you to where you want to be quicker. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, cool, Alex. Thank you for showing up today, man. I appreciate it. This was fun. Um, it was great meeting you too. I haven't met you before, but I'm sure I'll see you at one of these events sometime at at one of these real estate conferences or something somewhere. So it was great meeting you, man. And thanks for coming on today. Sounds good, guys. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you. See you, see you guys.